This meeting of the Star for War of Alderman will now come to order. Please rise for the saying of the Pledge of Allegiance, after which Alderman Vaughn would like to say a word of prayer, and we will observe a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> our God and our Father, most holy, all wise, all knowing, all powerful, all seeing, all hearing, all understanding God. Father God, again, here's a few of your handmade servants, these city officials that you have appointed, Father God, to handle the files of the city. Pray now again, Father God, that you will allow us to look to the hill which comes all our help. Father God, that you will allow us to lead this city in the direction that it needs to go. Father God, that every decision that we make will glorify you. We thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our big brother, our redeemer. Father God, we give you all praise and glory. Fill this place with your spirit. Direct our thoughts, direct our heart. Bless us to conduct ourselves decent and order. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory because you is our God and we your servants. You are our father and we your little children. Thank you so much for controlling our destiny, not leaving us in the hand of no man. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> You now have before you a copy of the written agenda. Are there any proposed changes to the agenda as written? Alderman Mayor. Since we've got a full house tonight interested in this and it's not only the official agenda, I would like to add under board business item D, discussion and consideration of appointing a police chief. All right, uh, proposed provision from Alderman Maynard is to add an item D under Roman numeral 10, board business, a discussion and consideration of, of appointing a police chief. Alderman Maynard, is that your proposed provision? Yes, sir. Do I hear any objection? Any objection? Any objection? Any objection saying none? Please note the change. Alderman Maynard, do you have further proposed revisions? No, sir. Any further proposed revisions from the members of the board? Are there any further proposed <coughs> revisions? Seeing none, a motion to approve the agenda as revised is in order. So moved. Motion has been made by Alderman Vaughn to approve the agenda as revised. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Alderman Wynn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. <coughs> Measure clearly passes. Uh, you've got interviews and then the approval of consent. Okay, so we'll take it in agenda order. Well, but also the um, the, uh, the first candidate that approved from North Carolina was set to vote by the uh, Captain Nichols has agreed to come up to what we stand on. Okay, uh, so we have uh, three candidates that are scheduled to interview tonight uh, for Chief of Police. There were originally four candidates uh, that were set to interview. Uh, a, a candidate uh, from North Carolina uh, withdrew uh, his application. We have three uh, candidates that are here and will interview. Uh, and uh, since that uh, changes our interview schedule some, uh, the, the, the 530 slot, uh, of course, uh, now is no longer filled. Uh, but Captain Nichols uh, ha has agreed to take uh, the first slot. Do we have all three of our applicants here? We did not have Mr. Shell. We did not have Mr. Shell. Okay. So we have. Uh, We have Mr. Nichols, Frank did agree, right? Mr. Shelton, and Mr. Grimes. Frank, Frank did say he'd go five. Mr. Grimes. Mr. Grimes is here. Yes. Is Mr. Shelton here? All right, Please. so we'll hear from Captain Nichols first. We'll hear from Mr. Grimes second. Or, well, if Mr. Shelton is here, we'll hear from Mr. Shelton second. And uh, if he is not here by that time, we'll hear from. Uh, Mr. Grimes second, then Mr. Shelton. And uh, for the applicants, and uh, if, Mark, if you could inform our applicants as they come in, I cannot compel anybody not to be in the room at any time because this is a public meeting. However, since this is a job interview, uh, 
I always do ask when we're doing job interviews at a board meeting if the applicants uh, will give each other the courtesy of not being in the room while their fellow applicants are interviewing. So do pass that along and be sure to pass it along uh, precisely like that because uh, it, it, we can't say anything uh, that would leave somebody to believe uh, that they cannot be in the room. All right, uh, at this time, uh, I'll call Captain Nichols. Captain Nichols, thank you so much for being with us. Please have a seat. Now, Captain Nichols, you have probably seen this interview process uh, before, uh, but uh, I, I will give you a synopsis of uh, how, how it's going to go. Uh, I will uh, start by offering you the opportunity uh, to make any introductory statement that you'd like to make, uh, and I'll have some questions for you uh, following that. Uh, after I've completed my questions, I'll open the floor for questions from the board. Uh, at the conclusion of that process, we'll be glad to hear any questions you may have for us as well as any concluding comments. Does that sound okay? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, would you like to make any, any introductory comments? Yes, sir. First of all, I would like to uh, thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for allowing me to be here today. In addition, I would also like to thank the Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor Perkins, and the rest of the board for affording me this opportunity. My name is Reynolds Frank Nichols. I go by Frank. I've been employed with the city of Starkville Police Department for over 21 years. I'm the father of two sons, Reynolds, who's 17, he attends Starkville High School, Jackson, who's six, he attends Southern Elementary School. In addition to my police duties, I also work as an adjunct instructor, instructor with the Mississippi Law Enforcement Training Academy in the Delta. I also work as an adjunct instructor with East Mississippi Community College. I'm a proud veteran of United States Navy and Army National Guard, where I've served during the Persian Gulf War and Operation Iraqi Freedom Three. I'm also a proud member of Bethel Missionary Baptist Church, where my pastor is the Reverend Dr. Lee Rand Jr. I hold an associate's degree from East Mississippi Community College, a bachelor's degree from Mississippi State University, and a master's degree from Troy University. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Captain Nichols. Uh, could you uh, please tell the board uh, any experiences, particularly job experiences, that you've had uh, that you feel uniquely qualify you for this position? Yes, sir. Currently, I'm a captain. I oversee the operations command of the Starkville Police Department. I've also held the command of administrative captain. I've supervised every unit in this police department. Um, I've supervised every personnel in this police department, with the exception of chief outlaw here. Um, I'm a lifelong citizen of Starkville. <coughs> in addition to my being a police officer, as I said, I'm an adjunct instructor where I teach cadets at the police academy. Um, new trends in law enforcement. I teach them uh, um, constitutional as well as Mississippi law. Um, I also serve as in law enforcement while serving in the United States Navy. Could you describe your management style and how that would be an attribute to the position? Honorable Mayor, I believe management can be defined as the process of planning, organizing, controlling, coordinating, and directing personnel under you. I've had the liberty to work under four different chiefs, including Chief Outlaw, all with four different leadership styles. I've taken a little bit from each of those chiefs. In my training, in my many trainings in the military and supervision, as well as law enforcement, I've always been taught there were three types of leaders. You have the authoritarian, which puts the mission first and the men last. You have the laissez-faire type leader, who puts the mission last and the people last. And then you have the effective leader, who puts the mission first and the people first. I've been taught that out of 100% of, of, of your employees, they're, they're divided into three categories. You have 10% of them that are going to be your problem employees. They need that authoritarian type leadership. You have 10% that are going to be your ex exemplary um, officers. They need that laissez-faire type leaders. Then you have 80% that's going to be your normal employees. So 80% of the time, Honorable Mayor, I will be an effective leader. 10% of the time, I will be authoritarian when needed. 10% of the time, I will be that laissez-faire type leader. How would you describe your ability to multitask? Mr. Mayor, I perfected that. Um, I, I must admit, um, 
in order for me to be a multitasker, I have to be good with my computer and smartphone. I rely on them a lot. As I told you, not only have I been here for over 21 years, I also work as an adjunct instructor at two different other uh, agencies. So I have to have the ability to multitask. In having that ability to multitask, I have to have people in place who I trust to do their job. If appointed chief of police, I will have my command staff who will be well trained, who I will put trust in to do their jobs. That way, I don't have to concentrate so much on being a micromanager. As CEO uh, of a police agency, I think it's imperative that all of your officers are familiar with the Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Sixth Amendment, Eighth Amendment, and the Fourteenth Amendment, which is the vehicle that propels them all. What gets CEOs and agencies in trouble more than anything is not being abreast of the Constitution. I often pose this question to my students at cadets when I'm teaching. Who or what polices the police? I get a variety of answers. The correct answer to that is the U.S. Constitution. More specifically, the Bill of Rights. I believe in the basic premise that everyone should be treated fairly. Thank you, Captain Nichols. Uh, at this time, are there any questions from the members of the board? Alderman Carver? Who's more nervous, me or you? I am. <laughs> <laughs> I've just got two questions. Um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for coming out. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for having me. And getting to know you as, a, as an officer over the last five years, six years has been a joy. Uh, what do you see as your first as uh, as your first year in office? If you were appointed, what are your first top priorities? Because you've been there, you know. And sometimes we have that opportunity to talk to somebody that's in the department. I like to ask this question, so you know, to kind of get a feel for what's going on in the department. But what do you think your top one to three priorities? I'm glad you asked that, uh, Alderman Carver. I have outlined a vision, and, a, and everybody know a vision without a plan is hallucination. I have ten objectives that I would like to see accomplished. Five over the next year. <coughs> the other five over the next three and a half years of your administration. The first thing that we need to get done in this department is to have promotions and restructuring of the department. Currently, we have vacancies in supervisory positions. We have to get those vacancy filled, if nothing else, for liability reasons. Number two, I would like to see our dispatchers not get a pay raise, but get a pay adjustment. They are some of the lowest paid employees in this police department, yet they are the heart is working. Not only are they taking calls from the outside on the phones and dispatching them, they're taking in foot traffic coming in from the outside. They're taking in foot traffic coming in from officers. They have to be multitaskers, and they do a great job. They need a pay raise. In addition to them, uh, our animal control officers need a pay raise, as well as, uh, as my uh, accreditation manager. She needs a pay adjustment as well. Number three, I would like to see um, the police department branch out onto social media, such as Twitter and Facebook, as an informative tool. I've done a lot of research on this. Um, Olive Branch Police Department, Gulfport Police Department, have Facebook and Twitter accounts. Whenever you have bad weather, the only thing you have to do is log on. Whenever you have high crime areas or a rash of burglaries, the only thing you have to do is log on and see what's going on. That's my uh, number three objective. Number four objective is to have meetings um, in each ward. We have seven different wards. I would like to set up community meetings with me and my command staff to hear what the citizens have to say as it uh, uh, refers to the police department. So often, you only hear about police officers in this board meeting, and it's not good. I would like to set up a meeting at least once a month with the, under the direction of the alderman of that ward to hear the concerns of the community. Number five, I would like to set up precincts other than at this station. Currently, we're in the process of establishing a precinct on Long and Alfred Perkins Street at the old daycare, thanks to Starkville Housing Authority for donating us that building. We're going to use that building to, to uh, house our community-oriented police, and we're also going to use it as a substation. I would like to set up an additional substation on the south side of town, one on the west side of town somewhere near the Cod District, and one on the well, on the west side of town, somewhere near the bypass, and on the east side, somewhere near the Cotton District. Number six thing I would like to do, I would like to establish a citizen police academy. Um, I've done a little research on this. 
um, using the model provided by Olive Branch. What they do is they take application from regular citizens to be a part of this academy. If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, they got like a two-year waiting list now. They've had several classes. That's when regular citizens get a chance to come in because we're transparent. We don't have anything to hide as police officers. They come in, they take different classes under the direction of police, police officers. They ride along with police officers in the cars. They get a chance to watch the dispatchers work. I think that helps bridge in that gap between the community. Number seven, I would like to see us reaccredited. As you know, we are state and nationally accredited. I served as um, accreditation manager overseeing that process. If I'm appointed chief of police, we will not drop that ball. We will continue to be accredited. Number eight, I would like to see us add at least five additional officers over the next three and a half years. Um, if you look at the national average um, in the South, per 100, per 1,000 citizens, there should be 2.6 police officers. Currently, we're operating with 54 police, sworn police officers and two part-time. If you look at citizens uh, comfortable to our size as Columbus, as Ridgeland, Columbus has over 77 officers. Ridgeland has over 70 officers. Um, Madison has about 100 officers. We can't be arrogant enough to continue thinking that we can continue operating with 54 officers. I would like to see us get five additional ones in the next three and a half years and five additional ones on the term of the next board. Pay raises. Pay raises are always good. We know that pay raises don't keep employees, but it helps. As an accreditation assessor, I get to travel all over the United States. I've been to several, at least 10 different other agencies where I grade them on their law enforcement activities. Starkville can compete with the best. I don't say that because I work here. I say that because it's true. We're one of the top agencies in Mississippi, and we're one of the top agencies nationally. Thank you. More than I asked for. <laughs> but I kept every one of them. Well, that, uh, that actually led into my <clears throat> second and final question is retention has been something that we've talked about over the last four or five years is uh, how the problem retain retaining officers. Put it out there. Yes, sir. Um, other than I think you addressed that with pay raise, anything else you might think of as far as camaraderie? building exercises or anything that you know of that we might could use to help retain officers? That comes from all of us in this room. Um, I think there has been a gap between the police department, the board, and the citizens of this community. I think there's been trust issues. I think that I can bridge that gap by involving this community in that. Um, pay raises does help but also being an effective leader. That's what helped keep uh, retention high. Time. <clears throat> and I plan on being that effective, effective leader. Thank you. That's all I've got. Alderman Wynn. Captain Nickel. Yes, ma'am. Had I known that you would do this, I would have gone to bed early last night rather than working on you all folders for doing my homework for this. Um, I'm kind of speechless. You've covered the your mission in here. That was one of mine. You spoke to community involvement. Explain to me about your education and your beliefs on that. I have, I don't have any questions, but what I will do, um, as Alderman, we received letters on your behalf as well as the other applicants' behalf. And what I would like to do is read a couple of those out loud. Uh, I don't know if you got those or not, but uh, you have a total of 13. And um, I'll read a couple. Chief of Police, Walter Armstrong, uh, Vicksburg Police Department. And I'll read a couple of excerpts. I'm confident Captain Nichols will be an outstanding role model who will demonstrate integrity and leadership while setting exemplary standards. I believe that Captain Nichols embodies the professionalism and integrity demanded by a career in law enforcement. Okay, Pastor Lee Brand Jr., Bethel pa uh, Baptist Church. He says, Brother Nichols' community involvement will function to improve the image of our police department, which seemed inapproachable to the citizens during the previous administration. All of the aforementioned reasons constitute my purpose for offering this recommendation for Reynolds Frank Nichols as the next Chief of Police for Starwell. Chief Don Gamage, Olive Branch Police Department. With his abilities, professionalism, and dedication, Frank Nichols will make a great Chief of Police for the citizens of Starwell. Captain Nichols assisted our accreditation team on numerous issues when we were seeking state accreditation. 
He exhibited a vast knowledge of law enforcement policy and administrative procedures. He also came to our department on a couple of occasions and served as an assessor during our promotional process for lieutenants and sergeants. Retired Chief Brenda Smith, Picayune Police Department. I was police chief for seven years and experienced the qualities that are needed to lead a police department in order to have the support of the citizens, police officers, and city leaders. I believe you will find all of these qualities in Captain Nichols. He is intelligent, capable, dedicated, and personable man. I feel confident as police chief he will be capable of handling any situation with professionalism, thoughtfulness, and integrity. <coughs> Dr. Helen R. Paddenkinard, citizen former teacher Starkville Schools. She said, Captain Nichols, record of self-evaluation and motivation is evident. He has worked to continuously improve himself in each phase of his life and those around him. His determination and commitment to excellence will contribute greatly in building a community of excellence in the SPD and the city of Starville, where excellence will not be an act, but rather it will become our habit. And I have see, two more, if you will bear with me. The ability, this is from Reverend Joseph Stone, Second Baptist uh, Church. The ability to communicate with diverse groups within the community is something our next chief will need to possess. I believe that his extensive service to the Starbuck community and to his country warrants that Captain Nichols be afforded the opportunity to lead the Starbuck Police Department. And the last one I will read is from Chief Sammy Shoemaker, Starkville Schools Police Department. The report we have with one another will only benefit the city of Starville and the Starville School District as two agencies continue their joint efforts of protecting and serving our citizens, children, and families of Starville and Octavia County. I know you will have to consider other candidates, but I believe the selection of Captain Nichols as chief will be the best for the city of Starville and the police department and the citizens of Starville. Those are all that I have to read. Captain Nichols, um, um, Captain Nichols, um, that's all that I have tonight. I yield the floor at this time. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Alderman Little. Thank you, Captain Nichols. You covered a couple that I had listed here to ask you, but I've got a couple I'd like to ask. Uh, what would you say is the biggest crime issue here in the city of Starkville, and what would be, um, how would you work to correct that problem? I think the biggest crime issue we have here would definitely be auto burglaries, um, and that's because we have, we're in a university town. Um, I expect and um, plan to do more public relations um, uh, announcements uh, pertaining to that. And plus, uh, as I said, more officers on the street can combat that. Okay. And by having those outside precincts, you don't have officers at the station. You have officers over the, in, in the communities. Okay. Um, <clears throat> at Starville PD, to what level have you been involved with the budgets and grant writings and, and things like that, uh, uh, planning and management? I currently I oversee the uh, the grants writings of um, the police department. Um, a, as a command officer here, uh, I was involved in the budget. I know that uh, the police department has a budget of three million eight hundred fifty-eight thousand one hundred seventy-two dollars. <coughs> uh, over three million of that comes from uh, personnel service and salaries. Um, so once a month, uh, the command staff would meet and go over the budget. Okay. If you think back over your law enforcement careers, there any single event that stands out that's impacted you more than anything? Um, there he is. Um, that was one time I um, responded to a call of a suicidal gentleman. And um, perfect gentleman, never been in any kind of trouble, <coughs> never had a police call to his house. Um, he had his, lost his wife of 60 years, an elderly, elderly, elderly gentleman. And um, his whole thing was to uh, have the police officers kill him. And um, I, along with uh, two other rookie officers at the time, I was a sergeant, responded to that location. And um, when we got there, and I knocked on the door, the first thing he done was launch at me with a knife, a butcher's knife about this long. And uh, instead of me stepping back, which I did step back and uh, retrieve my weapon, but instead of me firing at him, something told me, and it was a God in me, that told me, asked, asked me to ask him, why was he doing this? And he just stared at me. And we sat there a minute and had open dialogue, and I, I was standing by for me to you with him. and. Um, he got to telling me about he had just lost his wife and he had nothing else in the world. And I said, well, apparently you need to talk, so let's, let's talk about this. I said, but I'm not going to talk to you if you got that knife out. You know, and I, I got two rookie officers ready to shoot, you know. And um, I put my weapon up. They still have their weapons out. And I asked him to throw the, uh, the knife on the outside. And I would come in and talk to him. And he did just that. 
And um, we came in and we talked about an hour. And, um, I ended up having to uh, arrest him, um, but I only arrested him for one reason, and that was to ensure that he gets some help, and he did. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any further questions? Yeah, Alderman Mayor. Captain Nichols, we had on campus today, we had the Dallas Police Department interviewing our students at Mississippi State. They've got 286 openings. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell you that to ask you this question, though. Um, obviously, Dallas is a long way from Starville, and they took the time to come all the way here. What, what are some of your ideas that we can do to attract quality candidates to the police force in the city of Starkville? I think that we're already doing that. Um, we're one of the few police agencies that has a, a take-home fleet. When officers come here, we like to make the jokes, you get everything issued except your socks. Um, higher pay would definitely attract people. Um, Stark Starkville reminds me a lot of the city of Hoover, Alabama. The city of Hoover, Alabama has an exemplary police agency. And it's because of the citizens and the board and mayor, they rally around that police department. They have a waiting list of at least two or three years just to even take the test to get it within that police department. I mean, it helps that it has, that it has one of the highest salaries in uh, the state of Alabama. But the police department itself is a police department of integrity, and they pride themselves off that. And I see Star will be in that same way. Any further questions from the members of the board? Alderman Carp. Two more things I missed and I want to touch on. The take-home fleet, are you in favor of that? Yes, sir, I am. Okay. <coughs> and then uh, we, we talk about people know that may not know what we're talking about. Starville does let the officers take the cars home. We found that over time when you let somebody actually, you know, become their own car, I guess is what you're saying. And they got they, if something's their own personal and they're not swapping it out with other people, then the wear and tear is substantially goes down. So there's arguments for both sides of that, but I wanted to get your opinion on that. Second, uh, I already know the answer, but for the record, if you're if you are appointed, you are in favor of the current restructuring where you have an assistant police chief, or is that something you are in favor of? Yes, sir, I am. Okay, highly in favor. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Any further questions from the members of the board? Any further questions? I've got one. Uh, Captain Nichols, thank you for showing up tonight. I think, yes, sir. Uh, through uh, your, your presentation tonight and uh, the letters of support and your application is uh, is very thorough. Um, one question I do have is uh, if you're involved in a, an outside in incident, whether you're on the clock, you're off the clock, how do you, how would you uh, address that as a, as a police chief, maybe this being different than uh, an ordinary officer in the, in the police department? Would it, would it affect how you, how you address or handle that situation? No, sir. Uh, one thing we have to remember is this. Uh, officers are first, uh, uh, humans first. They're going to make mistakes just like everybody else. It's what they do afterwards that determine my level of control or my level of discipline with them. If they call and acknowledge that and report themselves and admit their wrongdoing or whatever part they played in that, then, yes, I will show leniency when, when dealing with them. But we have to lead by example. We have to be um, um, people of integrity. So the same stuff that a normal citizen would do, we can't do. Any further questions? Any further questions from the members of the board? All right, seeing none, Captain Nichols, do you have any uh, questions for us or concluding <coughs> statements that you'd like to I would make? just like to conclude with uh, thanks, Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Board for affording me this opportunity. I'm deeply grateful, and that's an understatement. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. And uh, I don't know if you were in when I asked for the courtesy of the applicants when fellow applicants are uh, interviewing. I cannot compel you to leave the room because this is a public meeting, but I always ask, uh, since it's an interview process, as a courtesy uh, that you uh, uh, allow them to interview without other candidates in the room. May I be excused? You may. Thank you. <laughs> Maintain the quorum. All right. Maintain the core. <coughs> Mr. Shelton.
Mr. Shelton, please have a seat. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. We thank you so much for being with us tonight, uh, and uh, I, I'll give you an overview of how the process is going to work. Uh, other than the fact that you are in a public meeting, yeah, it, it probably will be uh, similar to interviews that you've had uh, in the past. Uh, at the outset, I'll offer you the opportunity to make any opening statement that you'd like to make. Uh, I'll have a few questions for you, then I'll open the floor for questions from the members of the board. Uh, and finally, I'll offer you the opportunity to make any concluding comments you may have and also ask us any questions you may have of us. Uh, do you have any introductory comments that you'd like to make? I would like to. I'd just like to introduce myself to each one of you. My name is Frederick Shelton. I'm an experienced law enforcement officer and I have over 30 years of dedicated law service in the law enforcement with outstanding expertise in problem solving, accomplishing goals, and applying critical thinking in emergency situations. My strengths are properly applying good communication skills to resolve conflict and hostile situation. I have the ability to perform with tact and professionalism under pressure. I perform well as a team member as well as a team leader. I've been recognized on several critical occasions by my superiors and supervisors for demonstrating a take charge approach while paying exceptional attention to detail in life threatening situations. I'm a highly dedicated, motivated, and approachable coach, mentor, and teacher. I would love to share my vast amount of knowledge, experience, and excellent skills in law enforcement with your outstanding and progressive organization. I look forward to the opportunity to share these exceptional abilities to enhance the performance and image of your organization <coughs> as well as grow with your organization. Lastly, it will be a duty and an honor to serve side by side with your outstanding agency as a chief of police. Thank you. Mr. Shelton, do you have any uh, 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 experiences, particularly job experiences, that you feel uh, uniquely qualify you for this position? Yes, sir, I do. I've served as captain of the patrol division in Columbus, Mississippi for the last 10 years. During them occasions, I have, on occasion, I've acted as chief of police in the absence of the chief, making decisions concerning the department and critical incidents at the police department. How would you describe your management style? I believe in a Serving leadership type style, I believe in <coughs> supplying my people with the resources that they need to do the job. Not necessarily micromanaging them, but for making sure that they have the resources to make the decisions and to do the things that they need to do. And how would you describe your ability to multitask uh, and uh, the attributes that would be on the job? Again, based from my experience, both as a police officer and a <laughs> military police officer, I'm used to handling multiple situations at a time. Uh, and Basically, what you have to do with them situations is just take time and supply and have more than just a plan, but have several courses of action. Because things change, and then <coughs> when things start changing and environments start changing, situations start changing, do you have to adapt and overcome to them situations? Thank you, Mr. Shelton. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the members of the board? Alderman Carp. Thank you. First of all, thank you for coming out. I was impressed thank with you. your education and your seminary experience. Uh, I've got about three or four questions. Sure. So, first one. What do you see if appointed would be your top priorities within the first year of office? Again, most people would say to come in with change, but I would say the first thing we to do is to do a squat evaluation of the organization, to look at the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats to the organization. And after a proper analysis, if there's some things that need to be changed, then of course we would start making them change. But first thing would be is to do an analysis of where the organization is and what it needs and where we need to go in the future as far as planning short-term goal, short goals as well as long-term long goals. Okay. Thank you. Second, Thank you. and being an active police officer, I like to <coughs> ask this question, not me, but you. Um, retention issues, you know, we sometimes try to address retention issues, and I don't know how you do it in Columbus. Do you have any ideas that you could bring to the table of ways to keep officers? One of the things is, is to, again, supply them the resources that they need. <laughs> There is occasion when this job can be real tough and real critical. Most officers don't get in the job for the pay or for the money, but because we love our community. And that's what makes us so different, is that we love our community and we do our service. But one of the things that helps us to do the job better is when we have support from, again, the powers to be and from the community. I believe in the community policing principle that the police are the community and the community are the police. The only difference between me and the other ordinary citizen is that as a police officer, that's my full-time job to protect and serve 24-7. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, in Starkville, I don't know about Columbus, but in Starkville, we have a take-home fleet, which each officer takes their, off their vehicle home and it becomes their possession while they're um, on the force. Are you in favor of that? I am. You are? Okay. We have a similar program in the city of Columbus. Good. And then the fourth was recently this board um, restructured the police department to have an assistant police chief instead of two captains. Are you in favor of that? I would be. You would be? Okay. Thank you. Further questions? I do. I have Alderman Wayne. Captain Chapter. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for coming over thank this you. evening to be with us to interview. Um, I believe that any institution should have a mission statement. It provides purpose and fosters direction. What would be a personal mission statement for you as it relates to law enforcement? For this community, I would say to have my mission would to show <coughs> integrity, trust, and have the faith of the people to do this job. That would be my mission statement, to provide trust, integrity for the citizens of Starbucks. And my last question to you is, this. our police department has not, has not had the position of assistant police chief since the retirement of then assistant chief John Outlaw four years ago. If you are appointed as chief of police, whom would you seek guidance from within the department until you have an understanding of the procedural operations until you create and implement your own? I would solicit the information of the two captains available and from the staff as well. <coughs> we, the Columbus Police Department just went through a similar structure and we now have two assistant chiefs of police. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. And let me say this because I've already done it for one candidate. I would have loved to have read some excerpts, but I didn't have any letters on file for letters of support that were rendered to me in my packet. Thank, Thank you. Are there any further questions from the members of the board? Alderman Little. Thank you, Captain Chill. Uh, what would you say is the biggest crime issue facing Starkville right now? What would you do to try to correct that problem? Based on the connection that I have with Starkville in the Golden Triangle area, one of the biggest areas we have is burglaries and as well as uh, the crime problem. Both of them are similar related. However, the presence of police patrol and getting to know, working with the community, i.e. establishing a neighborhood watch program. One of the things that we have been very successful with in Columbus is establishing a citizen police academy where we take and bring the community in and have them to understand what we do and how we do it and how they can best help us. So it would be a two-pronged approach. First, our officer presence and then community support. At the Columbus PD, to what level have you been involved with budgets and grants and planning and management? As the captain of the Uniform Patrol Division, I have to submit a list of equipment needs that we have, and I usually make a recommendation to the assistant chief about what we need and how much we need. So we're at the process of now developing the budget, what we need. We need cars. We need other equipment. So I'm giving him prices. I'm doing the research to get prices of equipment and how much we need and what money is available to yeah, What's your money. operational budget over there, you know? About three million. Okay. And one last question, uh, Captain Shelton. If you think back over over your career in law enforcement, is there a single event that uh, has impacted you more than any other? Yes. One one of the one of the greatest things that have happened to me since I've been in law enforcement is the idea <coughs> of community policing. I was a young patrolman, and I thought that you know, the idea in the day was to kick butt and take names. <laughs> That's how you solve the problem. But however, I went to a seminar, a community policing star seminar at Jackson State University, and I was introduced to the concept of community policing, where police and community work together to resolve issues. And from that was the changing of my interest in law enforcement and how to do law enforcement. And I am now a pro proponent of community policing, bringing people and police together and solving one common problem because we basically have the same problem. I go to the grocery store, you go to the grocery store, we all grocery, go to the grocery store. So we all have needs. We all have life issues that we address. I live in the same community that the community lives in. So working with them and getting that together, that would be what I would think would be for me. Thank you. Further questions from the members of the board? Alderman Mayor. Appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you. What do you see as the biggest challenge in recruiting young officers that's a good question. 
because we're facing turnover at our department as well. Pay is not necessary <coughs> to draw this drawing officers or having a law. But one of the things is, is supplying them with career support, giving them options, going from maybe from patrolman to detective to community relations officer. It's giving them some goals, some short-term and some long-term girls, and providing them the training to get to them particular areas instead of just being a patrolman. Usually what happens as a patrolman, you get to that old sense of, you know, all I'm doing is out here riding the streets and I'm not really making a difference. And officers tend to get stagnated. However, when you give them career options and career trainings and show them that there's some other things that they can do and that there's other places that go, they reach and give them some goals. I think that helps with retention. Giving them some goals and giving them some options and some other places and some other things that they can do for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Alderman Walker. Captain Shelton, thank you for, uh, for joining us tonight and you. presenting uh, your view of how you, would, uh, how you would run this department if you were uh, appointed. Uh, the question I have is how, how do you inevitably, when you're dealing in, uh, with the police force, you're, you're going to come in conflict, uh, either uh, citizens or both uh, uh, internally. How, how would you propose to deal with conflict? One of the things that with conflict is you have to determine what the issue is because sometimes it may not just be a conflict it may be a misunderstanding so what I generally do is like to get both sides of the story and hear what's really going on and listen for what the problem really is or if there's really a problem sometimes it's a perception idea one person may say something another person may something they may misunderstand because it, during the heat of passion when you're in an argument someone you may well you just call me an idiot no I did you didn't hear me but what I said may have sounded like I was in it. So one thing in resolve conflict is to listen to both sides of the issue and then making a determination. And sometimes that may mean stepping back. There have been occasions when, I, when I'm with them situation, I step back and check myself and make sure I'm okay, make sure I'm calm, make sure that I'm hearing clearly what's being stated. I, I try to practice a, a little acronym that I call the Q-tip principle. I quit taking it personal. <laughs> Are there any further questions from the members of the board? <coughs> any further questions? Seeing none, Captain Shelton, do you have any questions for us or concluding comments that you'd like to make? I would just like to say that I would love to bring my expertise and training to the city of Starville. Some of you also I work with in Columbus Police Department. We have a good working relationship we're here with the city of Starville, and I would like to continue that relationship as the chief of police here. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Shelton. Thank you. And uh, Captain Shelton, I, I don't know if, uh, uh, well, you hadn't arrived yet, but I don't know if anybody told you in the hall. Uh, I, I can't compel anybody to leave the room since this is a public meeting, but I always ask as a courtesy uh, if uh, fellow applicants aren't in the room uh, while somebody is interviewing. That's no problem. Most of, most of the applicants are good friends of mine, and we have a long-term relationship working together prior to this. Mr. Grimes, uh, thank you so much for uh, the interest you've taken in this position and uh, taking the time to interview with us tonight. Uh, I'd like to give you a brief overview of how it'll go, and uh, aside from the fact that it is a board interviewing you in a public meeting, yeah, it, it is probably not too different from uh, most interviews for jobs uh, you've had throughout your career. Uh, I'll start by offering you the opportunity to make uh, any introductory statement that you'd like to make. Uh, and then I will uh, proceed by asking you some questions. Uh, after I have completed uh, those questions, I'll open uh, the, the floor for questions from the members of the board. Uh, and we'll conclude uh, with uh, you having an opportunity to ask any questions you have of us or uh, make any concluding comments. Thank you, sir. At this time, do you have any introductory <coughs> remarks you'd like to make? I would like to thank you, Mr. Mayor and the ladies and gentlemen of the board for letting me be here tonight and meet with you and apply for this position for the Chief of Police for the City of Star. The uh, position that I'm applying for is probably one of the most uh, difficult places to, to have a job and the most uh, responsible place to have a job. Congress has given us, the, as police officers, one of the, the rights to take the liberty of people away in the performance of our duties and requires to to enforce the laws. 
there could be nothing more important than preserving people's liberties and their freedoms. Um, to give you a little bit of information about me, <clears throat> um, I have 34 years experience in law enforcement. 17 of those years was in the administration and supervisory position, either with the uh, state of Mississippi, Sheriff's Department uh, in Clay County, or Sheriff's Department in uh, Lowndes County. Those responsibilities in and included overseeing up to 160 employees uh, with the Bureau of Narcotics and in um, and, and formulating multi-million dollar budgets. I was responsible for the training and the placement of people and to make sure that they were fully equipped <coughs> with the, the safety equipment that they needed to form their duties. Part of my duties re require me to uh, write uh, policies and procedures for agencies and for the uh, administration and preparation of uh, grants, multi-million dollar grants from the Department of Defense and Department of Justice. Um, I've also been responsible for, for uh, developing the implementation of the case management system that is used by the state government, uh, the state of Mississippi, the Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics right now, for all their tracking, investigations, and uh, intelligence purposes. Well, being an administrator has been my responsibility in, for hiring and selecting the people and uh, the placing of them around the state and, and, their, and their duties. Um, my, my jobs over the years have, have covered just about every aspect of law enforcement, from basic police patrol to criminal investigations to narcotics enforcement. Um, it's also given me the, the opportunity to serve the state and realize that all the, the stressful, stressful times that you have as an administrator in certain events, such as uh, the response to Katrina, where we had to, to uh, deploy to the coast, and we're responsible for the, not only our, our agency, but agencies from all over the country and placing them around in support of the, uh, the people down there that were devastated by the Katrina. Um, Through my career with the Bureau of Narcotics in Clay County and the Lowndes County Sheriff's Department, I've been responsible for updating policies and procedures and rules and regulations for all those departments and implementing them throughout the agencies. I've testified at all levels of courts, from justice court, city court, uh, grand juries and, and federal courts, and in state courts. I've sat on national boards for the, uh, the Bureau of Narcotics and uh, promotional boards for other states to help uh, show that they are fair and balanced in their promotional procedures. I've also been responsible to make sure that the Bureau of Narcotics and the agency I've worked for stay within the EEOC requirements when you're hiring people. Um, and one of the things that I've done over the years that was important to me was to establish relationships across the country, across the state, and especially here in the Golden Triangle area. Uh, no agency can stand alone, and they have to have every every resource that we can combined to do our duty. Thank you. And Mr. Grimes, the question I usually leave with is, uh, what experiences, particular job experiences, have you had uh, <coughs> that you feel uniquely prepare you for this position? You have covered a lot of that. Uh, do mm -hmm. you feel uh, there there are any additional experiences uh, that uh, you need to elaborate on? Yes, sir. I'll go over basically over my career in law enforcement with, you, uh, with members of the board. Uh, basically, I've been public service. I started in 1974. When I was 17 years old, and I joined the United States Army. I served at, uh, in Fort Knox, Kentucky, where I was a tank commander. And we, our responsibility at the armor school was to train West Point cadets and officers of the military on, on the operations of the vehicles. I got an honorable discharge from uh, the service in 1977. Uh, while I was in the Army, uh, I, I dropped out of school when I was in high school. And while I was in there, I got my GED and finished my high school education, and that's, uh, which was important to me at the time. 
And when I got out of the military, I went and started taking some of the college classes. Uh, 1980, I was given an opportunity to go to work for the Columbus Police Department as a patrol officer. I worked in all aspects of patrol for, for three years with them. 1983, I was a town marshal part-time in Sherman, Mississippi, where I was the only law enforcement officer within about 20 miles. So I was responsible for all the duties, which included collection of fines and fees that was owed to the, to the town of Sherman at the time. I served a short time at the Westmoreland Police Department as a patrolman until a position came open back in, in Lowndes County at the Sheriff's Department in 1984. I was a patrol officer, patrol deputy for Lowndes County Sheriff's Department from 1984 to 1988 until Sheriff uh, Prescott Kent was elected and he asked me to go into narcotics enforcement for him to run his narcotics, his, his part of the narcotics unit. I supervised one county employee while I was there and I'm responsible for the street level to internet. We were involved in street level to international level drug, uh, drug investigations. We investigated uh, anything from cocaine smuggling to uh, murder for hires at that time. I testified at that time during circuit, in circuit court, federal courts, and other grand juries around the state and in other states. In 1990, I was hired by the Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics as an agent and was assigned to the Starville District Office which is an office that uh, was primarily responsible for 10 counties in, the, in, the, in Mississippi in this area. I was responsible for my own preparation of my cases, case initiation, handling the funds, handling of the performance, presentations to the grand jury, and testimony in front of any appropriate court. In 1993 to 94, I was placed as agent in charge back over the Columbus Metro Narcotics Unit where I supervised uh, three agents and a secretary there, and, and all the uh, investigations that were conducted in that area. I answered the, to the sheriff and the chief of police as liaison officer for them as well. In 1994, I was re uh, reassigned to, to, due to district short, uh, short, uh, shortages of manpower back to the, the Starville District Office of the Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics, where I was an FD officer training new agents as they were coming in on the uh, operations of the Bureau the policies and procedures and investigation and techniques and tactics. In 1997 through 1999, I was promoted to captain of the Starville District Office here, in, which is over the, the 10 counties I mentioned earlier. I was responsible for uh, supervision of <coughs> all the agents assigned to that office. At the time, we had about six at that, in the office, plus an a administrative assistant. I was responsible for the liaison contacts for all the sheriffs and law enforcement in those 10 counties and the chiefs of police. Also responsible for all the media relationships and the preparation of the budgets to be combined with other district offices for the, for the agency. I traveled statewide and, and, and nationally on investigations and meeting with other uh, law enforcement officers on national boards. I was a liaison officer for the uh, Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics to the, United, to the Mississippi Senate where we presented our budget and uh, asked for any questions. In 1999 to 2000, I was promoted to major over special operation, which is an executive officer to the director of the Bureau of Narcotics. I was, one of the primary duties I had was overseeing a $17 million federal grant from the Department of Defense. It was a combined to set up a intelligence system for Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, and Texas. Um, I had several trips, had several travel dates to Washington, D.C., and all these other, these other sister states in developing this system. In 1999, I was also elected to a national board of directors for the National Alliance of State Drug Enforcement Agency, where we met with representatives from, from Washington and ONDCP to establish drug, national drug strategies that were being implemented around the country. In 2000 to 2004, I was the northern region major, uh, was commander of the northern half of the state of Mississippi. I mean, I was responsible for the supervision of about 65 to 70 agents and civilians scattered from Jackson all the way to, uh, to South Haven. Oversaw the, uh, the spending of all agency funds, preparation of district goals and targets, and preparation of, uh, of cases. 
I was a liaison officer to, to all the sheriffs and chiefs of police as well, at least in the northern half of Mississippi. <coughs> I met with committee chairs in the Senate and the House to discuss agency needs and explain the questions of the budget request. We also were in the process of uh, building district offices around the state before we would get bond issues in front of the legislature to build offices uh, to get us out of rental property to save money for our agency. I oversaw the implementation and development of a million dollar methamphetamine initiative grant during that time and the track and the auditing of that those funds. In February 2004 to 2009, I was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel over the entire state of Mississippi for law enforcement for all state narcotics agents. At that time, I was responsible for about 130 agents and employees scattered from Biloxi to South Haven. Part of the administration the duties were to uh, meet with all the sheriffs and chiefs of police in, their, in the, uh, their home offices, as well as any conferences that they attended, and discuss all their needs and desires from, the, from the, our agency and what we could do to assist them in, in the problems in their communities. I worked with the legislature to develop state laws as they, as they were impacted on the drug problem in Mississippi. Uh, worked with the director and the, uh, and the uh, public safety commissioner in response to Hurricane Katrina. We oversaw six months of response for our agency that lived in, on, on the coast during that time. Um, in 2008, uh, the deputy director of the agency was was moved into a staff position with the governor's office. I also assumed the duties of the director, the deputy director for the agency, which put me over approximately 160 employees at that time, including the agency, which I maintained my, my responsibility as the enforcement commander. In March of 2009, or February of 2009, I retired from the Bureau of Narcotics on the Mississippi Highway Patrol Retirement System. And I, uh, the sheriff of Clay County, who has been a personal friend of mine for 30 years, asked me to come to him and come to work for him and help him establish a cold case investigation unit. We had some, uh, some drug-related homicides that were, had been unsolved for six years, some as many as 14 <coughs> years. I set up a cold case unit with Clay County with another investigator and an administrative assistant, and we worked uh, a murder-for-hire investigation where we successfully identified, arrested, and prosecuted the person responsible for these murders. 2011, I returned to retirement. When I was contacted by Sheriff Mike Arledge, the Lowndes County Sheriff's Department elect, he was sheriff elect there, and asked me to come to work for him to assist him in this, the, the setup of a drug unit in Lowndes County and the reorganization of it. I had day-to-day uh, -day duties of supervision of seven sworn officers and an administrative assistant. During that time, we, we were responsible for taking millions of dollars worth of drugs off the street in Lowndes County, along with the, the assistance of the Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics and federal agencies in the city of Columbus. We, we took hundreds of thousands of dollars in funds off the streets with drug-related funds, which is a, it's no small task for a small drug unit like the city, uh, the city and county of Lowndes County. We refocused our agents on to quit worrying about trying to arrest every person that had, every, uh, had a rock of cocaine on them and focus on the people who were bringing it, the problem into the community those who were, walk, who were walking around trying to cause violent crimes with in arms during the time that they were committing these crimes. I thank you for your time. How would you describe your management style? I'm, I like to lead from the front, but I'm also, I believe in empowering the people who work for you. You give them a position, you ask them to explain to what their duties and responsibilities are, and you hold them accountable for performing those duties. And uh, how would you describe your ability to multitask? Well, if, as you've seen on my career as a enforcement commander with, a, with agencies like I, with the Bureau of Narcotics, it's like with any large agency administration, you have to wear several hats at a, a day and sometimes several hats at a time. Uh, you're, most of the time you're a firefighter trying to put out fires from people that are, are upset about things that have gone on. You have agency problems, you have financial problems in the physical departments, 
you have to meet with liaison or the sheriffs to discuss their needs and there's always a, a constant change in what you have to, to address you have to handle them all with the same uh, importance at this time are there any questions from the members of the board <coughs> Carver. thank you first of all I was impressed with you I mean you've got a stellar career uh, and all the experience and all the classes you've had and I thank you for that and I thank you for your military experience as well all right I've asked these same questions to each person so um, if appointed what do you see as your top priorities in the first year of office here in Starbuck well the first thing I'd have to do is uh, get inside the department and see uh, what I have I have to see if, what the, if they have a five-year strategic plan or any kind of plan to design to, uh, to, for the future I would have to meet with the administration to see if there's any political uh, ramifications on things that are going on or, or desires from this administration that need to be implemented I wanted to evaluate the uh, where we have manpower and what those, those those positions are and whether they can be better served as a civilian performing that task instead of a uh, sworn officer uh, they, I think it, we, most agencies they do have that um, I need to look at the budget and see where we are with the budget and, and within the current fiscal year or you can make decisions you know it's, if, it's easy to go in and say I want to make my mark on the department but making a mark is sometimes just leaves a bad mark it leaves a scar Yes. If you don't know what you're doing going into it, you need to plan what your actions are, evaluate what the department's needs are, and what the resources we have available to us, and go forward from there. Okay. Um, secondly, is dealing with the, with the retention of officers. Maybe other than pay increases, do you know any other thing? I'd like to ask this question for active law enforcement. Do you know any other issues or, or any other uh, remedies we may have for any, uh, ways to retain officers here in Stroud? Officer retention is, is one of the problems that face every agency around the, the country. Uh, men and women are always looking to improve themselves, either through uh, moving to different agencies, moving to federal agencies. Uh, and I have no problem with people trying to improve themselves. I'm, I'm never going to try and hold anyone back that wants to go to a, to a job that they feel that betters them or betters their families. Um, <coughs> money is a short time motivation. It's always good to pay people and pay them and pay them good wages so that they can afford to feed their families and take care of them. Um, one of the main things that people stay in agency is work environment. If you give them good leadership, you treat, make fair decisions based on the needs of your agency and explain and have people explain to them why that, these decisions are being made. People tend to accept that and stay with you. Thank you. Third, um, I don't know if you're familiar with or not, but Strava has a take-home fleet. Each officer is assigned that car, and that becomes their car. Are you in favor of this? Yes, sir, I am. Okay. Just I think community. leaving the cars in the community deters crime. Anytime you see a police car in a, in a neighborhood, it has an impact on the people who are there to try to do harm or, or do foul play. Yes, sir. Thank you. And then lastly, um, is this board recently restructured the police department to have assistant police chief instead of the two captains? Are you in favor of that? Having an assistant yes, police I am. chief? Okay. I think it's always important to have someone to second command so you have a, 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 a proper chain of command where people know the steps to take to get things done in the administration. A, a, a chief also needs an assistant there so he doesn't have to, all the burden of responsibility on him for all the things going on in the department. He, he needs to share responsibilities. And those two positions need to work hand in hand as partners running the department. Thank you. I yield the floor. Any further questions from the members of the board? Alderman Webb. Thank you so much, Mr. Grimes, for interviewing with us tonight. Yes, ma'am. I'll just have two questions and one. Um, you gave me an idea from your resume here, and I'll read this and then I'll ask you a question. Sure. It says, in 2000, I completed certified public management. This was a two-year course designed to enhance all aspects of personal and professional managerial abilities, as well as teach you how to make your mission fit into real-world solutions. What would your personal mission statement state or reflect if you are appointed chief of police? Pardon me, I'm sorry. What would your personal mission statement reflect or state if you are appointed chief of police? Just what I explained to Alderman Carver just a minute ago. I want to come into the department 
and leave it a better place after I leave here than it was when I got here. And I, I want to do it in the right way, in a structured way, and so that I have the support of the community and that the community feels safe with the police department they have. And not only do they feel safe, but they are safe. They're safe in their person, they're safe in their property. Okay. My last question to you is, our police department has not had the position of assistant police chief since the retirement of then assistant chief uh, John Outlaw four years ago. If you are appointed as chief of police, whom would you seek guidance from within the department until you have an understanding of the procedural operations until you create and implement your own? I see that you have two captains in, in the police department right now. Those are your senior supervisors in the department. Those will be the first stop that I go to on, on any decisions. I believe in the chain of command has to flow both ways. It has to go me through the people who, who work for me, the captains, the lieutenants, and sergeants down to the field, and it needs to come up the same way. I don't, you don't need people jumping the chain of command. You don't need people jumping to the chief of police when they have a problem with a sergeant on their shift. And those people actually run the, the, the department. And my last, um, I'm going to read two. Um, letters of support you received two in our packets. Yes, ma'am. And it says his dedication. This one is from Sheriff Eddie Scott, Clay County Sheriff Department. It says his dedication to law enforcement and his knowledge of the laws and investigative methods make him invaluable to our department, as I know he will also be to the city of Starwell. And the last one is from Laddie Huffman. He's retired sheriff of Clay County. And it says um, Starwell will be fortunate to have Bobby as chief of police for his knowledge of law enforcement and his administrative leadership. Thank you so much. Thank you. Further questions from the members of the board? Alderman Little. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Grimes. I've got a couple of questions, the same three questions rather than I asked earlier. Uh, what would you say is the biggest crime issue facing the city of Starkville right now, and how would you work to correct it? I believe it faces all communities in, in, in America right now. And of course, with my background, you know, I'm going to think drugs, and I believe it is the drug problem in the country. It's not only the sale of drugs, but it's the, the abuse of drugs and the addiction to drugs that we have in the communities. Now, the police department is, is strictly a public safety function of government. And we don't get into the fixing the addiction problem. We, we have to face, we have to address the ATF, and we, I've worked with all of them during my career extensively. I've had, you know, my relationship with the Bureau of Narcotics goes without saying, I have, still have friends that run the agency. Um, you've, I would, if I was the chief of police, I would place the narcotics and co-house them with the sheriff's department so you have a, a, a city county unit so all your resources are not duplicated, your efforts are not duplicated, your, uh, your investigations are joint, everybody knows what's going on, they share information about that because people who are in the county come into the city to sell dope. People in the, in the city go out in the county and sell dope. And if you don't have that flow of information, you know, he's enough of the investigation, and then you're, you're, you're butting heads. You've got to communicate and you got to work together. Okay. At the MBN, to what level were you, were you involved in budgets and grants? And you mentioned some of that earlier, planning and management. Uh, we, well, like in, in, in um, 1999, we had the uh, um, Southern States Initiative, Southern Gulf States <coughs> Initiative, which was a Department of Defense initiative that was designed to develop a communication or a intelligence system and, and case management system, sharing system between those five states I named. That was a $17 million grant that it ran through the Department of Defense. We had to meet with the, the Senator Cochran's office and the, the other senators were up there at the time, or the representatives at the time. Um, and then in 2000, we applied for a, a million dollar meth grant through Senator Cochran's office, and we received just shy of a million dollars. And that, that money was used to set up, start our own case management system just strictly for inside the, the Bureau of Narcotics, as well as uh, by all the equipment we needed to address the meth plight that was, that was coming into Mississippi at the time. That means respirators, SCBAs, vehicles, all the equipment, the safety equipment that the agents need, the training, the medical examinations, and that's what we spent for across the state. Um, we, we got those repeatedly during the, uh, the time I was there, and it was to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars. We got money from Homeland Security to upgrade our uh, uh, emergency power systems for, that, for the agency there. And we, we had to, to put
quick. Uh, the, the, the building we were in in Jackson <coughs> had no backup power system, so we had to, we had to do that. Okay. If you think back over your law enforcement career, is there a single event that impacted your life more than any other? Oh, that's it's easy. That's Hurricane Katrina. In our response, we were we were activated by the governor as the first response team, and we were the first law enforcement on the coast in the in relief for the state. <clears throat> the devastation that we saw there, and the, and the the hurt that people were going through there was tremendous. We had a tremendous responsibility to to provide some safety and security for the people there that they had lost everything, and we were there for for, for months. When we first started with uh, search and rescue along the coast trying to find if there's anybody that had survived the storm that was still trapped in the uh, debris field that had washed in about a quarter of a mile from the shore for about 150 miles across the bottom of our state. Uh, we moved from that to body recovery and we would GPS, we would find body, when we were looking, doing the uh, search and rescue, we'd do GPS and have to move on and we'd have to come back later on and recover those bodies and that was, that was a tremendous toll on my agents, uh, it was a tremendous toll on me and the administration and the state. And one of the things we did to address the, the, those problems is that we, we had counselors there on like the second day. And every, and every agent that went through that had to go through counseling to make sure that they were, being, they were okay with things going on in their life. Thank you. Any further questions from the members of the board? Alderman Mayor. Appreciate you coming tonight. What, yes, what do you think the biggest challenge you see in recruiting new young officers into this field or? It's, it's, uh, it's hard to find people who are qualified, that have the desire to stay with this uh, career long term. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not for everybody. I, I, can, I can assure you that. I've, I've seen people that I've hired that I'm sure I thought they would make good agents and quick into it I realized that I, I'd made a mistake. And, uh, uh, I've had people that I've hired that were probably some of the best. Um, I think we have to go out to the, the colleges and the, of these career developments and the, the people who are getting these criminal justice degrees and, and see our, our need in our community and our department with those, those people. And those are the kind of people you want to reach out to uh, that, that will have a tendency to, to stay with what they're doing and, and stay with you. And they'll be honest with you. Do we have any further questions from the Alderman Walker? Uh, Mr. Grimes, thank you for uh, coming out tonight and sharing yes. uh, your, your career with us. Um, undoubtedly, there's going to be uh, instances of conflict uh, with, with the police department. Can you tell me a little bit about how you how do you address and deal with conflict? Uh, it depends on what kind of conflict we're having. If it's internal, you know, I, I let the, the, the supervisor, first level or second level supervisor, <coughs> handle those kind of conflicts. Um, once they address it and they've reached a conclusion, then I want to meet with them and just dis discuss it. And we'll, we'll discuss the conflict and the resolution that they've come to. And I want everybody to be on the same page moving forward with any kind of resolution. Uh, conflicts with the community, I want to be there to answer those, those complaint complaints and I want to be able to uh, address them honestly. But I, I, can't, I, I don't believe that when a, a complaint comes into your department, you should up. Uh, have a knee-jerk reaction to it. I think you need to listen to what the people have to say, pass it on to your people in your department, let them investigate it, let them see if it, what actually happened 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 in the way that you were told. Get both sides of the story, and then come to a resolution on it. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions from the members of the board? <coughs> Seeing none, Mr. Grimes, do you have uh, questions or concluding comments for us? I appreciate the time that you've taken and, and allowed me to be here tonight. And I know that y'all have a tremendous responsibility of making a decision to, to lead this department. And I support whatever, any decision you make. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Grimes. Thank you. Thank you. Maintain the court. Without objection, I, I need a very brief recess. Any objection? Any objection? Thing done. We'll reset the camera. <laughs> the meeting will now come back to order. And
The next matter that you have before you is the approval of the consent agenda. Is there any objection to the approval of the consent agenda as revised? Any objection? I guess it wasn't revised. Uh, any objection to the approval of the consent agenda? Any objection? Any objection? Any objection? Seeing none, the consent agenda is approved. Uh, and that will take us to Announcements and comments by the mayor and member of the board, uh, and I have one comment this evening, uh, and that is just a uh, general announcement uh, that the uh, contract for the uh, Carver Drive uh, ditch project was signed today. Uh, so particularly, maintain the core, uh, particularly if you are a resident of Carver Drive, uh, you, you, in, in the near future, uh, that is a very significant uh, uh, construction project, so you're going to start seeing a lot of heavy equipment uh, and disturbance in the area. Uh, the project should be completed uh, within the next six months, uh, and, and it should be an improvement when it's completed. Uh, now. Are there any further comments from the members of the board? Alderman Carver. First, the candidates can come back in, right? They can. Sure. Okay. I've just seen it. Let them know because a couple of them, I think, have stuck their head in. Yeah. I got another comment. Yep. This relates to the uh, equality resolution that the board passed uh, last meeting, and I think y'all have all seen the headlines and everything like that going on in the paper. Uh, these are my comments, not the board's. This resolution is not state statute, not a city ordinance, has no legal binding, but I think it was our, I know it's our statement of intent as a city. While some may argue that it has no legal basis, I believe it portrays what type of city we want to be recognized as. I originally voted for this resolution because I thought that it protected us legally as a city and it showed us that we do not discriminate based on, and I quote, race, color, religion, national origin, sex, gender identity and expression, age, marital status, sexual orientation, family status, veteran status, disability, and source of income. And since we just didn't discuss that, and that was my fault for not bringing it off consent agenda, I've got a couple questions to ask. Uh, and I guess I asked this either to the chair, Alderman Perkins, or the mayor, or the Taylor Adams CAO, whoever wants to answer it. But <coughs> since we didn't discuss it, what exactly is the family status mentioned since we already mentioned marital status? Chris, do you want to speak to that? Family status mentioned? Mm -hmm. Well, we had a marital status mentioned in there as being protected, and then it says familial status. I, since since I had some authorship, authorship here, I, I took that to mean uh, basically, uh, and, and Chris, if this is incorrect, you can correct me, but I took it to, to, to mean uh, single parent households. It could, I mean, it could, it could speak to any type of household. Uh, you know, the, uh, Two parent, single parent. I mean, I, just that. I, the the goal with with that resolution was um, to take the the broadest definition of equality that we could find, and uh, and so that's where uh, that, that that was the intent there. Okay. Yeah. There's. Uh, I'll add a couple comments. Uh, se several of those categories uh, do overlap. Uh, uh, for instance. Uh, race, color, and national origin can all overlap. Uh, the, uh, the, the purpose of that statement uh, is, is to be the broadest <coughs> statement of non-discrimination uh, possible. Uh, and perhaps uh, uh, more to the point, uh, that uh, statement uh, is modeled after uh, the non-discrimination policy that Mississippi State University adopted uh, uh, years ago. Uh, so you, you will find uh, that all of those categories closely track with that policy. Okay. I thought so too, but I guess I didn't read between the lines. There were several things, and another is gender identity and expression, and what exactly is that, but I'll leave that open. Um, but to finish my comments, but it was brought to all of our attention shortly afterward that this was a very progressive document and it was a win for the gay lesbian group. <coughs> and as you all know, headlines for the next several days titled this as being a win for the city as a whole. But I did not see veterans celebrating a so-called win. I don't see a single mother celebrating a so-called win. 
I don't see people of all races, creeds, and nationalities celebrating a so-called win. I only see a small group claiming a, claiming a victory. I was told that this was simply a good document for the city in the terms of legal protection, and I understand what it was generally trying to do. It was not presented to me as a pro-homosexual document or a document that favors one group, such as gays or lesbians. Ironically, this, is, this document was intended for the protection of all, but is being displayed as a political win for one group. The city of Starville has never been accused of discriminating, discriminating against someone because of their lifestyle. <coughs> Actually, there have been several city employees and elected officials who are gay. To this end, it shows the diversity that the city employs. I bet not one of those employees or elected officials could ever name a time that they were discriminated against because of, li of their lifestyle. Starville, as a city, probably represents every nationality, creed, and race under the sun. This is because we are a college town, and we have the opportunity to welcome visitors from all over the globe each and every year. And the fact that we are as diverse as we are in a small rural Mississippi town is amazing in itself. If this document is, in, is indeed intended, like the newspapers have said, to promote transgender and homosexuality, then I cannot support it. It is not in line with my beliefs in the way that I was raised. I believe we failed to discuss this resolution before the last vote, and we must go back and look at this. In this situation, all I have and all I understand I have is my one vote. But my vote will have to be against this resolution. And I mistakenly voted for this resolution the first time, and I apologize. Alderman, this is your call to action. If and when you are given the opportunity to join me on this matter, I hope that we will rescind this resolution and bring it back to the table for writing with full board participation. I've gotten to know each and every one of y'all over the last year, and I've come to respect your character as an individual. And with that, I will yield the floor. Well, let me provide some uh, context uh, for the resolution because it has gotten uh, <coughs> quite a, uh, a good bit of uh, coverage in the media, uh, both on the statewide level and, and nationally. Yeah. And uh, it's a resolution uh, that uh, two weeks ago uh, passed without incident, uh, which uh, I, I view as wholly appropriate. Uh, it, it was intended as a, a housekeeping measure. Uh, actually, it's a suggestion uh, of the city's chief administrative officer. Uh, and uh, it, it came uh, in large part uh, uh, from his background, uh, having worked in uh, procurement at Mississippi State University, uh, and uh, advantages uh, uh, from those experiences that he sought to bring uh, to his current role with the city. Uh, and uh, it was his suggestion that having uh, a broad, uh, the broadest possible uh, non-discrimination policy uh, uh, it, it, it is something uh, that is a helpful tool for the city uh, when applying for grants. Uh, now, uh, I have said uh, when, when I've been questioned about it uh, since the passage of it, uh, this it does seem very much like a no-brainer uh, to me because, in fact, uh, the, the practice of not discriminating against anybody uh, was, was certainly uh, in effect before the city passed a resolution on it. Uh, However, where it is significant uh, is through the grant process. Uh, but, uh, often, uh, there is a scoring criteria uh, for uh, non-discrimination policy of the city. Uh, since the city uh, has this document uh, in writing now, uh, it now can be presented uh, and uh, can help the city uh, in, in the grant process. Uh, and again, that, that's, that's the basis of the measure and, and why you get it on, on paper. Uh, now, the aftermath of this, uh, when it was passed, uh, uh, was, uh, was unique uh, in that uh, probably as much statewide and national news uh, was made uh, by city action uh, as uh, by any act uh, since I I've been doing this job. Uh, now, I viewed that uh, as a welcome development uh, that people all over the state, indeed all over the country, uh, were talking about Starkville as a place of tolerance uh, that uh, uh, despises discrimination in all forms. Uh, so uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, that was a, a wonderful day for the city, uh, and uh, I see no need uh, uh, to discuss the matter any further. Are there any further comments uh, from the members of the board? Any further comments from the members of the board? <clears throat> Seeing none, we'll move now into citizen comments. 
Do we have any comments uh, from citizens? Uh, any citizen wishing to make comments may do so by coming forward, introducing yourself, and you'll be recognized to speak for a maximum of three minutes. Greetings to the men and board. My name is Alvin Turner Ward Seven. Our uh, this Black History uh, Month, we want to uh, thank all of our officials uh, that is taking the lead in making a difference. I really want to recognize our, 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 our I mean, by Man Perkins and all my Thank you. Uh, citizens has a few things. Uh, the smart bus, we, 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 we kind of run into a traffic jam uh, and it's kind of uh, frustrating the people that uh, we jammed up and but then we can't break no laws. Uh, 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 I was on the bus Saturday <coughs> Uh, and I was on the bus today, and uh, I'm constantly getting the word out. Uh, but uh, that traffic jam is, is, like, is kind of agitating the passengers. But uh, uh, the driver has to stay calm. But let like, you know we appreciate this right here. Like, it's a big help for people that can't drive in uh, less hassle. The housing authority. Would like to let uh, Jerry Jefferson was the guy that we had problem with. Uh, uh, would like for you to talk to him. Uh, we have a lot of 30 year old, 25 year old uh, residents that uh, might not have the mindset as I do. Mm -hmm. um, police chief, Latin, we would like to get someone that that will help us our, uh, stay together, not apart. <coughs> uh, and I'm definitely gonna have to walk the line now it because our, uh, my church member, I wouldn't want him to put handcuffs on me, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Thomas, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Thomas where, where's, where's the traffic jam at on the smart bus? What area is this traffic jam? Uh, well, Main, Main Street and uh, uh, like on Main Street, and then we kind of get our uh, congested when we get ready to go to 25. All right, that we kind of congested because we in the school traffic. All right, if we could kind of uh, loosen that up, that would help. That's what I'll get ready to ask you. What time of day was it? You told me the right time. School well, time. well, uh, they start from seven to seven to six. Uh, uh, running from seven to six o'clock in the evening. Okay. So, uh, so that it gives them me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Do we have any further citizen comments? Good evening, Mayor and Board. I'm Jim Gafford, Ward 5, and I would just like to say two things. One is uh, I think it is fantastic that without fanfare you passed a uh, unanimous uh, resolution supporting our existing 2% tax uh, and continuing that. Uh, now, we can all debate at length on how that mon those money should be divided up, but I think that time has passed at this point, so I want to applaud you for taking action on that. And I'd also like to say that I, for one, and I've heard from many others, uh, thought that the passage of the inclusion resolution was a fantastic idea for the city. It, it, it means something to have it in writing that we accept all people regardless of their state of being. Um, we can take personal issue with that. Uh, we can be informed by our faith on these matters. But as a government body, I think uh, our responsibility is to be apathetically agnostic. We don't care. And we don't know, and we accept all people, as long as it's not impacting the job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gaffer. Do we have any further citizen comments? <coughs> any further citizen comments? 
<coughs> good evening to everybody, to the mayor, and to my board of aldermen. I would just like to say, you know, each and every one of you special to me, so I would just like to say thank you all for what you've done. As I sit here today and listen to what went on, you know, with the candidates that we had, I would just like to tell y'all, Mrs. Dorothy Bishop, who's a long time, you know, resident here in Starkville, she died today. She would have been proud of what went on here tonight. We had some applicants that was really, you know, outstanding. And I would just like to say, I'm not pushing, you know, for anything, but the decision is a decision. I'm not pushing for anything. I'm going to leave that up to you because, see, I value the, the vote. I do. I value it very much. And I would just like to say, today, tonight, tomorrow, any other time, whatever God got is for in the city of Starkville. I would just like to say, let's step up. Let's step up and be what we are. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hodson. Mm -hmm. Do we have any further citizen comments? <laughs> any further citizen comments? <laughs> any further citizen comments? <coughs> All right, seeing none, the next matter before the board is the consideration of appointing a city clerk with the duties specifically defined in Mississippi Code Section 21-15-17. Prior to opening the floor for discussion, uh, I, I'm going to make a few comments. Uh, we uh, actually conducted these interviews last night. Uh, both of the candidates were excellent, uh, and I can say uh, without a shadow of a doubt, uh, uh, both uh, would make excellent uh, city clerks. Uh, however, there can be uh, only one uh, city clerk, uh, and, and I do have a recommendation, uh, and that is uh, Lisa Hart. Uh, Lisa uh, has been working uh, for the city uh, for about a year now, uh, and uh, in addition to proving herself uh, very capable on the job, I, I think Lisa's story uh, is significant as well. Uh, of course, Lisa uh, served uh, as a city clerk uh, in, in the city of Eupora uh, uh, for some time prior to coming to the city of Starkville. Uh, she chose to uh, come to Starkville as the chief deputy in the clerk's office uh, and uh, has performed quite admirably at, at every step in the, in the road. Uh, and uh, it, it is those experiences, uh, uh, knowing her uh, to be uh, what I think is no exaggeration to say, uh, one of the most talented uh, employees you will find in a clerk's office uh, anywhere in the state of Mississippi. Uh, that I think uh, that she would be an asset uh, uh, to serve the city of Starkville as our next city clerk. Uh, Mayor? Alderman Carp. I'm going to make a motion at the end of this, but I concur with what you've got to say. It's, um, it's been a rare treat for the last two department head hires to, to hire people with experience. With that opportunity <coughs> comes people that kind of can step in. You know, we had questions tonight of what you're going to do in the first six months to a year. But Lisa's been there. Lisa had a, has a lot of experience, and I've, I've actually had for the first time, uh, not the first time, but I've had people stop me lately that I don't know, never going to know, never meet in the grocery store and say, just have great things to say about her. Uh, that, that's kind of interesting to see that, you know. But with that, I'd like to make this motion. I can either read it out if you need me to, or just put a comma at the end and put Lisa's name. Do, do you have it reduced writing? I've it, got what's here on the. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, just. On the agenda. Okay. Do you want so your motion would be uh, to appoint uh, Lisa Harden? Yes, sir. As the city clerk with the duties specifically defined in Mississippi Code Section 21-15-17 through Section 21-15-23 at a salary of fifty-eight thousand uh, dollars per year, subject to a six-month probationary period. Alderman Carver, is that your motion? Yes, sir. Do I hear a second? Second. second. Motion's been seconded by Alderman Wynn. Alderman Carver, you wish to speak on the merits? No, sir. Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. It's unanimous. <coughs> Congratulations, Ms. Hart. And the next matter before you is the discussion and consideration of appointing a police chief. And likewise, I have some introductory comments uh, that I'd like to make. Uh, uh, I, I do not have to tell uh, each of you in the room how good each of the interviews we just heard uh, were because you were all here uh, to hear them. 
And uh, I think it does go without saying at this point uh, that all three of the men that interviewed to be uh, Starkville's next police chief are more than qualified, and Starkville would be well served uh, by each of them. Uh, however, there can be but one chief, uh, and I do have a recommendation that I would like to make. Uh, I have uh, had uh, the, the pleasure of uh, getting to know uh, Captain Frank Nichols uh, for uh, nearly five years now. Uh, and uh, I have observed uh, uh, but a small portion of his career uh, because he has been with the city much longer than I have. Uh, and in that time, I have come to respect uh, the work that he does and the person that he is uh, greatly, uh, as you saw uh, demonstrated in his <coughs> interview tonight. Uh, I think his story is significant. Uh, that, uh, he, he was uh, born and raised uh, in the city of Starkville. Uh, of course, as a father uh, that has worked for the city of Starkville for many, many years uh, as well, uh, and uh, ha has worked his way all the way up the ranks of the Starkville Police Department, uh, and uh, at some point uh, has worked with every single aspect of that department. Uh, additionally, has continued uh, to further uh, his education and training uh, to the point uh, where he is now called upon uh, by other uh, law enforcement agencies throughout the state uh, and region uh, for his expertise. Uh, it is for those reasons uh, that uh, I recommend Frank Nichols uh, to be the next chief of police for the city of Starkville. Discussion. Alden Perkins. Mr. Mayor, in light of your comments, uh, I move that uh, Reynolds Frank Nichols be appointed chief of police of the city of Starkville effective immediately in an annual salary of $73,500, subject to a six-month probationary period. Motion has been made by Alderman Perkins to appoint Reynolds Frank Nichols uh, to be the uh, police chief of the city of Starkville, effective immediately at a salary of $73,500 per year, subject to a six-month probationary period. Alderman Perkins, is that your motion? Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Motion has been seconded by Alderman Maynard. Alderman Perkins, do you wish to speak on the merits? No, sir. Any discussion? Any discussion? Alderman Maynard. I was very impressed tonight with the candidates. 85 years of law enforcement experience came before us tonight and interviewed. I think either one of those candidates that interviewed tonight could have effectively led this department. <coughs> All things being equal, I yield my support to the internal candidate just because it's the internal candidate. And we want to have our workers within this city feel they have an opportunity for advancement within this city. Again, every candidate was excellent, highly qualified, and experienced. I think last two weeks ago, there was some concern about the pool of applicants. I think that concern was waived tonight as all three of those candidates presented themselves extremely well. Thank you. Further discussion? Any further discussion? Mm -hmm. Alderman Webb. Uh, thank, I, I thank the all three of you for coming before us tonight. And I spent several days going over my packets on you all and created a folder for each one of you all. What I noticed that the three of you all had in common is that you all have all served our country. For that, I say thank you so much. Mr. Mayor, you have the floor at this time. Further discussion? Alderman Ball. <laughs> this, this, this is to Chief All Out. Thank you so much for coming on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can get ready to go on back on vacation now. Thank you, Chief. Chief, I'll have some comments for you in a moment. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Alderman Perkins' motion, please signify by raising your hand. All those opposed, please signify by raising your hand. By a vote of six in favor, with one against, this measure passes. Congratulations, Chief Nichols. Now, 
Chief Outlaw, uh, I, I do have a few comments I'd like to make with respect to <laughs> your service. Uh, of course, uh, I cold called you uh, one afternoon, uh, asked you to come by the office, uh, and in a very difficult situation, uh, asked uh, if you would come out of retirement uh, uh, to serve the city uh, for what uh, turned out to be an indefinite period of time. Uh, uh, now, I initially uh, bargained, bargained for about two weeks, uh, but uh, true uh, to uh, the person that you are and the servant of this city that you have always been, uh, when that turned out to be a longer period of time, uh, you didn't blink. Uh, and uh, we have been most fortunate uh, to have you uh, in this time uh, leading our police department. Uh, your uh, experience with these officers and the knowledge, uh, the wisdom uh, that you have accrued uh, over the years uh, proved uh, to be just perfect, and just the perfect blend uh, of uh, knowledge and expertise uh, and steadiness uh, that, that was needed uh, through a difficult time. Uh, so I will be eternally grateful uh, for the sacrifice uh, that you have made uh, for your city and uh, your city's better for it. Thank you very much. All right, uh, I have gotten a request for a brief recess without objection. Uh, we're going to re recess briefly again, and we don't have anything but claims docket and executive session materials. So, uh, is there any objection?